I'm Damon Wilson. I want to welcome all of you here. I'm the Executive Vice President at the Atlantic Council. We're delighted to be back uh, in Istanbul and as part of this summit to have an important conversation about uh, the continuing extension of Euro-Atlanticism uh, to this region and beyond, uh, the focus of uh, the summit here in Istanbul. Um, this, this issue is really a topic which is at the core of what the Atlantic Council does. It's at the core of our mission. Um, it's about helping to create a community that's based on the values of freedom, democracy, free markets, rule of law, human rights. It's the shared values, the common interests that bring the Atlantic community together. Um, the idea of extending Euro-Atlanticism has been really driven by the processes of NATO and EU enlargement, sort of as vehicles for advancing this, this political liberalization. And it's really helped to create a Europe that's more whole, more free than ever in its history. Um, it's been an animating policy for U.S. foreign policy objectives that's been shared in terms of a bipartisan consensus and a transatlantic consensus on forging a Europe whole, free, and at peace. Yet many today, as they look out across the landscape and they look to Europe's south and Europe's east, are concerned that this vision, that this approach, that this strategy is running out of steam. Um, is there still a momentum to build a Europe whole, free, and at peace? We have a Europe that's gripped with a Eurozone crisis, in many respects, as we heard from one of our speakers this, this morning, maybe it's a, uh, an identity or leadership crisis. There's increasing skepticism towards the East among uh, many political actors in Europe. And the United States itself sees itself as less invested as a European power itself. Um, its so-called pivot or rebalancing towards Asia has focused priorities elsewhere at a time when it's really focused domestically on this issue of our fiscal cliff coming in the coming, in the coming weeks. And yet there remains demand, there remains interest, and there remains progress on this front of extending Euro-Atlanticism. And I think that's represented by many of the speakers we have here today. Um, to get us into a conversation about where are we headed with the Western Balkans, with Turkey, with the South Caucasus, Ukraine, Moldova, uh, but even further afield in terms of Russia and Central Asia's relationship to, to, uh, to the Euro-Atlantic region. Um, to get the conversation started, we're going to turn to four terrific panelists today. Uh, we'll start with uh, Minister Egemon Bash, who is the Minister for U European Union Affairs and the Chief Negotiator with the European Union. He's played that role since 2009. He served as a Member of Parliament since 2002, when he was a Vice Chair of the Justice and Development Oc Party, responsible for foreign affairs. Um, he's been a prominent voice on, tur on tur uh, Turkey's relationship uh, towards Europe, Chair of the Turkey-U.S. Uh, Interparliamentary Friendship Caucus, uh, and also been active in the arts scene here in Istanbul. We'll then turn to Minister Alec, uh, Alex Petriashvili, the State Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration from Georgia. Um, uh, Minister Petriashvili is part of the newly elected Georgian government of the Georgian Dream Coalition. Uh, he served previously as the political secretary for the Free Democrats, which is part of that coalition. Served as Georgia's ambassador to Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, as well as spending time in the United States and the, the OSCE. Um, we'll then come uh, to a voice from, uh, an active voice from Europe on these issues. Uh, Theria Omen Reuten, a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands. Um, she served, as a, uh, served in the European Parliament since 1989, has been an active member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, served as a delegate to the EU-Russia Parliamentary Cooperation Committee, and is the rapporteur for Turkey. Uh, she's been active in Dutch politics within the Christian Democratic Appeal Party. And then finally, we'll come to Jan Sturza, the former Prime Minister of Moldova, now the CEO of Ram Patrol uh, in Moldova, uh, who has uh, uh, played a key role in his country in its thinking about its path towards Europe, um, who has pursued in private sector his own banking career, uh, and continues to play an active role with Ron Patrol's activities in Russia and the, and the CIS states, um, and served as Prime Minister in 1999 uh, when it was, when one, one analyst noted it was a tenure that manifested, Moldova manifested as a cabinet that was democratic, reforming, and truly attached to European values. Um, so to kick off our conversation, let me turn back to you, uh, Minister Bosch, on Turkey's relationship with Europe. You've had the lead in the negotiations uh, that have been taking place with the European Union. Uh, you've been uh, stewarding the relationship uh, for many years now. Um, in the midst of what's happening both with uh, uncertainty in Europe itself about what, how it's dealing with its immediate crisis, how it's thinking about its long-term future, and with Turkey's perspective of uh, greater confidence in what's happening here economically, 
uh, greater role that Turkey is playing in the region and indeed the world. How do you see Turkey's relationship and path towards Europe today? Well, first of all, let me welcome everyone to Turkey, to Istanbul, most importantly to my election, uh, to my constituency. Um, <coughs> great to have the Atlantic Council again in Istanbul, and I'm looking forward to next year's uh, event because this is really becoming an established Istanbul event. As far as what European Union is and how we perceive our relations with that organization, first we have to understand that the European Union is not only a political project, not only an economic project, but more important than all of them, is a peace project. It has established stability and peace on the continent. If you look at the history of EU member nations, you realize that the continent had faced long wars, bloody wars, uh, <coughs> devastating human tragedy, and because of the European Union, for more than a, for a period of more than 50 years, we have stability and peace on the continent. So as far as I'm concerned, the EU is the grandest peace project of the history of mankind. But it is yet a continental project. It has room to grow, it has potential to grow, and I believe membership of countries like Turkey can turn this continental project into a global one. Talking of peace, and I think global peace is at a major risk has been threatened since last night because of Israel's irresponsible attack to Gaza. At a time when a new president is trying to form his own cabinet in Washington, when there is turmoil in Syria, when there are preparations for elections in Iran, and where there are major disputes going on in Iraq, this attempt, which is geared towards creating a, another uncertainty, not only in Israel and United States, but throughout the world, is not going to help those of us who believe in peace. We condemned it very strongly, and I think this panel should also voice a very strong statement against ending all types of violence throughout the world, especially in the Middle East. NATO is also a very important peace project. It's just like European Union ensures peace, NATO has been a very important deterrent against those who want to put an end to peace. And I don't think EU and NATO should be analyzed separately. For many countries in the region, and you mentioned the Balkans, the former Soviet republics, which two of them are represented here, the NATO perspective is very, very important to anchor their not only sovereignty, but also their relations for peace with the rest of the world. And Turkey, as a very determined member of NATO, is 100% for enlargement and having an open door policy to all those countries who are ready to accept the founding principles of NATO, which are not very different than the founding principles of EU. And one of the most relevant questions I get when I travel within my own country is people, Turkish constituents, voters ask me, my taxpayers ask me, how come we have been good enough to die in NATO operations for the very same values for more than 60 years, but we have not been good enough to become a member of EU which embraced the same values for more than 50 years? Because Turkey has been trying to become a member for 
53 years, since 1959, to EU, whereas we have been one of the strongest members of NATO. So there is an oxymoron, and I think that also needs to be addressed for us to give a better signal to all the future members of NATO as well. Thank you very much, Minister Bosch. Uh, I'm going to come back to you, Ria, to pick up some of those issues. But first, first let, me, let me turn to uh, uh, Minister Petriashvili. You've just heard uh, Minister Bosch say that Turkey is 100% for the idea of enlargement, a continued open door policy, framed NATO and the European Union as these great peace projects. Well, obviously, you've just come to power in Tbilisi in a very dramatic election uh, with the Georgian Dreams uh, surprise victory at the polls in October. Um, your prime minister has just had a visit to, uh, to Brussels uh, to meet with the EU and NATO leaders uh, to reiterate Georgia's commitment to that. Um, and your country is one that actually, uh, in terms of the Great Peace Project, has known violence, has experienced a war in 2008 uh, with Russia. So given that context, given, can you give us a sense of where you see Georgia going, where this new government intends to take Georgia in terms of its Euro-Atlantic aspirations? Thank you. Please. Uh, thank you. First of all, let me thank uh, the Turkish host for hosting this uh, very important event on energy and economic. Uh, I would like to thank you, the Atlantic Council, for giving me this opportunity to participate in the, uh, and share with you my, uh, my thoughts in the very important and very crucial time for Georgia. You know that uh, we had uh, very important historic uh, elections, parliamentary elections in October, and uh, Georgian people uh, Georgia as a nation has uh, demonstrated the uh, political maturity showing that uh, the peaceful transition of power in uh, the country is possible and, uh, and the democratic development after the elections is possible. This is uh, uh, Georgia has uh, shown as a good model, as a good example for further development of the democracy in the country, of the democratic institutions. It is very important to underline that uh, Georgia's foreign policy priorities, key foreign policy priorities, will, are, uh, and will be remaining as the Georgia's integration into EU and Georgia's integration into NATO. I appreciate uh, uh, my Turkish colleagues and friends' support for, uh, for uh, our in enlargement of EU and NATO and Georgia. We always feel the support from our uh, friends and partners to Turkey on uh, Georgia's aspiration. You know that uh, the upcoming uh, ministerial in uh, NATO uh, will be very important for Georgia and for the Georgian people to demonstrate the progress and uh, uh, adequately assess uh, the Georgia's progress and Georgia's achievement on uh, the uh, very peaceful transition of power. And we, we hope very much that the ministerial meeting will underline and uh, will, uh, will provide the adequate um, uh, assessment to the Georgia's uh, successful elections. But uh, what I wanted to underline as well that uh, uh, despite the uh, political differences, uh, all uh, major political forces are united in Georgia's aspiration to become uh, NATO and EU members. And when it goes to the, uh, to the national interest and to the foreign policy priorities and the security priorities, we uh, agree, uh, all political, major political forces, that uh, Georgia's security and Georgia's stable and secure future is in NATO and is in EU. Uh, in this regard, uh, I must underline that uh, the, uh, under the previous government, the process of the negotiations with EU on the association agreement on the deep and comprehensive free and trade uh, areas uh, has been uh, very successful and uh, we will be uh, not only continuing, but try to accelerate. 
uh, and looking forward for the next year Vilnius uh, European Neighborhood Summit. And uh, we hope very much that by that time we will demonstrate the uh, uh, steady progress in the democratic development and in the negotiations. We are very optimistic on concluding at least the negotiations and hoping to sign the, uh, have the signed agreements. But you know, this Georgian dream is the um, name of my coalition. So uh, some of our dreams have already become the reality and we hope that the dreams of Georgia getting as close as possible to EU and NATO will uh, become the truth. And so the Georgia's European perspective uh, is, uh, very much awaited in Georgia because uh, this is Georgian people's decision. Not only particular political party's decision, but this is Georgian people's decision that we must, we have to become the member of NATO and member of EU, member of the larger European family. And uh, this process, I can assure you, is uh, irreversible. It will go forward and uh, it will go forward with through all the instruments and the political dialogue. Next week, we will be um, again in Brussels uh, negotiating uh, within the NATO structures, will be the uh, NATO Georgia uh, ambassadorial uh, meeting and uh, the uh, preparing for the NATO Georgia Commission, which is very important too for the Georgia NATO relationship. Of course, uh, with regard to the security challenges, and here was the issue raised uh, by the distinguished minister. First of all, I must say that Georgia has transformed during the years from the consumer of the security uh, to the contributor of the security by participating in inter international security uh, uh, operations, particularly in Afghanistan, I must say that shoulder to shoulder fighting with our friends and partners Georgia is becoming, has become the uh, number one non-NATO uh, contributor to the international operations and is committed to contribute further after 2014. Uh, it doesn't matter how the operation will transform in the civilian or the military um, uh, format, we will be very active in the planning process and we will be very active in uh, providing and contributing further to the uh, security in, the, in Afghanistan and in the region uh, in particular. But we have our uh, own regional uh, security challenges. It's well known that uh, we have conflict with Russia. We had a very dramatic war in 2008. Uh, we uh, uh, have 20, more than 20% of the Georgian territories occupied by the Russian forces. Uh, we are very grateful to the international community for the um, very strong support of Georgia's territorial integrity and sovereignty and for very successful non-recognition policy. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the Georgia's integration, uh, the process of Georgia's integration in NATO and EU is a reversible process. But we all realize that it is, there is a need, there is an importance for the Georgia-Russia dialogue to be uh, opened, reopened, to be started. There is a very important instrument for that dialogue, Geneva process, Geneva talks, and uh, there is no alternative for the moment for the Geneva talks and we are very strong, uh, strongly supporting to continue uh, within the Geneva framework our negotiations with Russia. But also uh, just very recently the Prime Minister has appointed his uh, uh, personal representative in talks with the Russian Federation, very experienced and highly qualified Ambassador Zura Babashidze uh, in order to give new opportunities to be opened in, the, in regard of the uh, establishing cultural, humanitarian, and economic ties between Russia and Georgia. You know that we have supported and agreed on the Russia's uh, accession uh, to the World Trade Organization, and we will be uh, looking forward to see the economic ties opened and the trade 
which is important for Georgia, uh, to be reopened with the Russian Federation. Of course, it will not uh, be in exchange of any of the Georgian national interest, and uh, especially and in particular with regard to the EU and uh, NATO integration. But uh, it is very obvious, and this is the demand from the Georgian uh, population, from our voters, that it's important to open the economic ties and relationship uh, with the Russian Federation. It can be a good tool for further normalizing the relationship, de-escalating the relationship uh, uh, and the rhetorics to remove the rhetorics from our bilateral relationship. And uh, in uh, conclusion, I must, um, this is the energy and economic summit, so we are very much uh, supportive to the diversification of the energy uh, transportation routes and uh, we are already hosting the two very important uh, um, projects, Baku Tbilisi Jehan, Baku Tbilisi Erzurum, with our uh, Azerbaijani and the Turkish uh, strategic partners and friends. We are realizing the project, which is a very important element for the uh, energy independence, for the uh, non-dependence of the Europe on uh, particular energy providers, and uh, for Georgia, it was really absolutely very important. In last uh, few years, we managed in parallel with realizing the, uh, the providing the transit to the international energy projects, we have uh, developed very much our internal hydro, uh, hydropower uh, market and hydropower resources. And uh, we are inviting the foreign investors, but we are strongly again uh, cooperating with our uh, Turkish friends and colleagues in that regard. We have become the exporters. You, uh, Damon, and other friends, of course, remember the, uh, the dark, dark days of Georgia in the uh, early 90s. And now I'm proud to say that Georgia has again transformed into the uh, provider, contributor, and provide exporter of the energy resources, electric energy resources. So for us, what we are hearing, the diversification of the energy routes is very important. Of course, <laughs> my preference is that uh, to have as much energy resources being transported through the Georgian territory and the pipelines. And I have heard that there will be an increase in uh, the natural gas uh, being transported through the Georgian territory. But uh, I believe that in general, the uh, security, the energy security, the political security is very much, very much dependent on the will of the uh, Georgia's nation, first of all, to develop democratically, and of course on our uh, partners, international friends, which are very much supportive to our country. And thank you very much for, I'm sorry for my little bit long speech. No, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I, there are quite a few issues I want to bring out in our conversation, uh, so I'll come back to you to follow up. But uh, before I do that, let me come to, to Ria, to Ria Omen uh, Reuten. Uh, you represent a European uh, uh, Parliament voice, uh, an important one on the discussion about the, the future of uh, European enlargement. You've heard from Minister Bosch about uh, Turkey's uh, interest and in, in, uh, frustration in terms of some, uh, in terms of the length of the negotiations with the European Union. You've heard from uh, our Georgian minister about uh, a continuing consistent appetite in Tbilisi uh, for movement towards both the European Union and NATO. Um, given what's going on in Europe right now, given the challenges that European leaders are facing, uh, with the Eurozone crisis, the actual future of the European Union itself, uh, what uh, the entity is going to look like, how much of an appetite is there really for the continued extension, if you will, of Euro-Atlanticism, whether it's through European Union or NATO enlargement into this part of Europe? Let me, let me, first, let me first start by uh, uh, congratulating uh, our Georgian uh, minister. It was indeed, and I did it in, uh, I said it also in a press regulation, a uh, peaceful uh, transition. We are a bit worried on um, 
the fact if they can continue it to be it peaceful. Because if we are speaking about NATO and the European Union, we are speaking about values. And what we sincerely hope is that also for members of the former government that um, if something happens, the independent and impartial justice will be guaranteed. We have some uh, doubts there, and, um, but I count on Georgia. I count on Georgia that they will respect everybody in the country, also the opposition. That's one. Um, the second point is what you mentioned. You want to um, continue um, the relationship with the European Union and also with NATO. In the same time, and that we are looking at now, you want uh, to defreeze the relations with Russia, which is a good thing. I'm also responsible for the, my political group, the biggest one in the parliament, for Russian relations. So that's a good thing. But how can you do both? That's what I would like, uh, would like to know. Because the statements we had up till now give us not the, 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 the right answers up till now. So perhaps uh, you could, uh, we could discuss that. Second is on uh, European Union and relationship to Turkey. We accepted Turkey as a candidate country of the European Union. And that was a big deal. Because in a community of now 500 million European citizens, we accept to enlarge with 75 million Turkish citizens. That can't be neglected. But in the moment that we accepted Turkey, we said, you have to share our values. And our values, they are at the heart of our cooperation. And what are our values? That your country is a democracy. Turkey is a democracy. You respect the rule of law, that you have an independent and impartial justice. Therefore, reforms are needed. That you have, not only uh, in your constitution, in your legislation, a recognition of the human rights, but that you also live along it. And there is nowadays a massive critic criticism on Turkey, because the reforms are slowed down. And what, it, what is in particular of, of importance is the re reforms in the judiciary field. That is what we are telling each other. And that's a message which, which you don't like. And if you tell because us... Because it's not accurate, I'll, I'll yeah, tell you yeah, what. Yeah, and if you tell us that NATO is of major importance for both of us, besides we also have the European Defense and Security Policy, because we want to share our part in the NATO, but many soldiers are brought in danger because of the fact that Turkey doesn't recognize Cyprus, and because of that, you, 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 don't, you are not willing to, 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 to uh, implement the Berlin Plus Agreement. It's a problem. That's a problem. So what we have to do is start perhaps a new dialogue and have a bit more mutual uh, trust and confidence and not uh, a shouting at the European Union when we show you the mirror. You can't say the, that it's a broken mirror, it, it's a, you had another word for it. You can't say that. And you can't say, I don't pay attention when also the parliament, and I am responsible for that, presents a report to Turkey in which the good things, but also uh, those uh, questions which have to be solved in your society uh, are mentioned. You don't need to reform for the European Union. 
you need to reform for your own democracy, for your own citizens. Because if you want to be a modern and prosperous society, then reforms are needed. And that's the battle we are doing. And if we are speaking about freezing relations, yes, last half year, the relations were frozen because a member of the club is not recognized by you. So please, come up. Uh, 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 you, uh, also, by, by, by doing, as, as a big country, as a big nation, doing some steps towards a solution of the Cyprus question, please come up with that. We can't accept that a member of our club is not recognized anymore, and we don't need to repeat what we said. I was uh, as disappointed as you were when the, 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 the Anand plan was not accepted in 2004. I was the same. But there is a new reality, and in that new reality, we want to be Turkey in. We know that we need each other. As, 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 as countries which have an, a rule of law, which have values, but also in, in, in economic terms, we are uh, 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 highly dependent of each other. More than, more than uh, uh, half of your trade is with European countries. So we are dependent of each other, but do your utmost to do something and do also accept a mirror to which you said in 2004 that you would accept it. That's, that's it. Fine. Uh, yes, if I will. So, Prime Minister Sturza, with your indulgence. So, because Rioman Reuten has put uh, some serious issues on the table, both for, I think, you, Minister Bash, and you, Minister Petriashvili, I mean, this is a voice who has been involved in helping to prepare the reports in the European Parliament on Turkey. Um, and so, how do, uh, part of, as Americans watch this debate, one of the questions I want you to pick up on this, um, respond to the issues of the values, the rule of law, how does the constitutional reform process, civil military relations, media freedoms, human rights, the Cyprus issue, how does all this fit into the way Turkey thinks about Europe? But as an American watching it, also how do we avoid a dynamic that goes into play of finger pointing between Brussels and Ankara that creates more of a negative spiral away from uh, Turkey and the European Union membership rather than a positive spiral towards that? So please, please res respond and then I'll come to you, Mr. Minister. Well, first of all, Ria, thank you for waking me up and provoking me uh, and giving me a chance to share some of my frustration because really the history of Turkish-EU relations is a history of unkept promises by the EU. And I'll share some of them with you in response to some of your allegations. You asked my Georgian colleague how they plan to enhance their relations with Russia and EU at the same time. First of all, you should ask your so-called president state, how come they are making statements that they have not decided to borrow funds from Europe or Russia, and they are still in the process of discussing it for their economic crisis. A member state of EU who is now in the process of running the presidency is serving as a laundry facility for Russian banking system. When it comes to a member state, they can get away with it. But for a potential member state, you're even questioning their talks. I, I don't think this is really uh, realistic. Now, you mentioned that Turkey uh, should accept the values. And that's why in my opening remarks I said those values are also in NATO. When it comes to taking advantage of the second largest military in NATO, the largest military in Europe, Turkey is fine with these values. But when it comes to EU membership, there is a question mark. Now, you said reforms are needed and relations have come to a, have frozen. You are dead wrong, Ria. In the last six months, relations were not frozen because we created a new concept with the Commission called Positive Agenda. In order to go around this Greek Cypriot presidency, we established eight working groups on eight 
chapters that have been blocked by member states. And some of the things that were not resolved between Turkey and Europe during the last 30 years were resolved during the last six months. For the first time, all member states gave the Commission the authority to start visa liberalization talks with Turkey. For the first time, the Commission sent us in writing that closing benchmarks on four different chapters have been met by Turkey. And as soon as the political blocks are lifted, the Commission will present to the Council uh, proposals to formally close those chapters. You mentioned the Cyprus problem. What is so unacceptable to anyone with common sense is how come the Cyprus problem was not a prerequisite for membership of Cyprus is now being portrayed as if it is a prerequisite for membership of Turkey. If Cyprus issue was so important for you guys, why did you allow a country, despite your own acquis, that has not resolved its own border problems? Two days after the referendum which you mentioned, the EU Council unanimously took a decision, April 26, 2004. The EU Council said, we will put an end to all isolation against Northern Cyprus. And today is the 29th birthday of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, and I congratulate their prosperity. For the last 29 years, there's not been any bloodshed, any argument. So the establishment of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus has been good for the whole island. And the council decision on 2004 said the EU should start relations with Northern Cyprus. Implement your own decision. We're not asking you to do anything new. No, you have not implemented that decision because four days after that, the Greek Cypriots became a member and they blocked the decision. But that was a unanimous decision. So EU should realize it has a major credibility problem outside of EU. You don't like my phrase about the Commission's progress report, broken mirror? I'll tell you, I was in Rome two weeks ago, and I met with the Speaker of the Italian Parliament, who had served as their foreign minister. And without me opening the issue, he said, I read your statement about the Commission's progress report, and the term you, use, you used, broken mirror, is the best example, the best analysis I've heard in the last couple of years about the attitude coming out of Commission. So there are there's, uh, different approaches to that terminology as well. You can ask Speaker Fini uh, on that uh, issue. Now, you mentioned that we need reforms for our own. That's we know. That's why we're doing it. And in the last six months, which you claim that the relations were frozen and the reforms had come to an end, we passed the third judicial reform package through our parliament. And as a result of that package, 35,000 people were released from Turkish prisons because they were detained for too long. 35,000 families have been reunited during the last six months. I'm not claiming Turkey is perfect. We have issues. But believe me, many countries around the world, including many member states, are not perfect either. As a matter of fact, there is no perfect country. If you analyze enough, you can find a whole list of misconceptions and uh, wrongdoings in, in every country. But what is different in Turkey is we're taking major steps. In the last six months, we passed the law on ombudsman, and right now, as we speak here, the Turkish Parliament Committee is electing the ombudsman of Turkey, which is an EU regulation. So our reforms have not stopped. Our reforms are going faster than ever, and I am very serious about this. Turkey is the most reformist government in Europe today. Looking at the need for reform in Europe, you guys are acting much slower than we are, and I think you should also do your own reforms for your own sake. Europe needs to reform itself. With this concept of unanimity in every decision making, you're forcing your economies to go to a bankruptcy. And I think as a future member, we care, and we should also help you look at your mirror so you can fix your uh, problems because we don't want to join a bankrupt union, we want to join a strong union and that's what we will do our best to help you.
Thank you, Minister Mister. Let me, let me just... You are, uh, going, you are going a bit far. <laughs> you are going a bit far. Uh, first of all, let me say that, that I am absolutely happy... By the way, we are used uh, to yeah, this, yeah, the two of us. I am absolutely happy that you embrace now the positive agenda. You know that I did it, and you also do it. So on that issue, we don't have any comments uh, uh, anymore. If you I had not embraced it, it, it would not it. be in you effect. It. Yeah. Second, <laughs> thing, <laughs> second thing is that on the visa issue, uh, I think it's of major importance for both of us. But uh, to get it through, we need something. We need also a readmission, a readmission of the refugees. And, Write and me a date. Give me a date when visas right. will be lifted for Turkish right. citizens. Yeah, readmission but, 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 but agreement but will go know, in effect tomorrow. Yeah, but you know we'll try that to go through one, you one, one by one, one here. Then, then on, um, on the, 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 the major problems of uh, Europe in, 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 in the financial crisis. Yes, we have a banking crisis in Europe. But I was last week, I was in the United States. And if the receipts of the United States would, would be taken by the European countries, then we would be really bankrupt. Because if you look at the United States, 17 billion, nay, 17,000 billion uh, uh, public debt. Public debt. And who caused our problems? Because our banks were so connected to the, to the uh, American banks. That is the cause of the problem. It's not and, and, and from the beginning, a European problem. No, it came from the global linkage between our banks towards American banks. And you know that. And we are trying to solve it. We are trying to, to give countries uh, the time and the money to restructure their economies <laughs> and to look over that their budgets are uh, 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 equal uh, in the... Uh, and and yeah. re, re, the issue yeah. here, rather than the relitigate the, the crisis, the issue is how is this going to impact the Europe's ability or willingness to continue to move forward, whether it's with Turkey or Georgia or Moldova, on uh, DCFTAs, on visa-free travel, on the process of European integration? What, what, what you should distinguish is, is following. First of all, we have uh, candidate countries, and Turkey is one of the preferred candidate countries. And what I see is that more and more European countries, a European a chancellor of, of uh, Germany, is willing to accept that. Yep. They had remarks, but they are less and less. So that's one. The second is we can't have everybody in, in due time in the European Union. So that means that we have cooperation agreements with some other countries. And that's also the case uh, uh, for Georgia, for instance. We do our utmost, but we can't negotiate and accept everybody at the same time. Mm -hmm. so, so I want to make a point of trying to get through our, our discussion and to bring in some questions from the audience as well. So we've got more issues on the table. I'm going to come back to you, Mr. Minister Petrosvili. But give me a moment, uh, Prime Minister Storza. I want to hear from you. Uh, you're here representing uh, Moldova, representing uh, a country um, that at a time of a lot of concern about transitions in Europe's east, there's actually a degree of optimism about Moldova to some degree. Uh, you've made progress with the European Union on a deep and comprehensive free trade agreement. Uh, there's even discussion about whether Moldova will be given a pers European perspective uh, in the coming year. Uh, the U.S. House of, Cong uh, House of Representatives is going to pass legislation, I think, this Friday to rescind the jackson Act restrictions on Moldova as part of your membership in the WTO. There actually is some momentum on this issue, so give us a perspective from Kisinau how you see the whole process of the extension of your Atlanticism to your country, but more broadly in the region. First of all, I, will, I want to mention this discussion because, between you because uh, when we launched these initiatives with the Atlantic Council five years ago, we are not expect such an intensive dialogue between European Union representatives and Turkish representatives. It is a great achievement of our initiatives. Uh, Mr. Kempe was here. Congratulations. Um, 
from the beginning, I want to apologize for, on behalf of uh, some in, uh, higher level officials from Moldova, which are supposed to be today here. But due to the fact of inopinant visit of Mr. Rogozin in our region, and uh, needs to be in the country and to meet and to be part of the show and PR of Mr. Rogozin, they postpone and cancel visit uh, in Istanbul. But, uh, and so you, you can take up the question that Ria put also, how do you, how do you pursue yes, the right relationship this, with Russia and the, Europe I, at the same this time? This fact shows no contradiction between uh, our European perspective and collaboration with Russia. We need to care about this relation because Moldova is a small country. It's in just in the border between two walls. And we are Moldavians lives simultaneously <laughs> at least in three informational, culture, and economical system. One is a former Soviet Union, a CIS region, one is a local, and one is a European Union. And we take care about everything. And mentally, culturally, we are in the same time in different world. We are speaking different lang language. We are, in the morning, we start to show, to see the events in Central Asia, Russia, Moldova, Romania, Europe, and this is our you know, advantage and the same time is disadvantage when you speak about, you know, why Moldova at the same time uh, maintain a good relation with neighborhood and with Russia and European Union. Uh, Moldova, of course, it's in favor of European future because Moldova geographically, historically, politically, it's a part of Europe. It's not far from the geographical center of Europe. And of course, according to social polls, two-thirds of our nation, uh, population is in favor of European Union. It was some time, eight years, which will be ambiguity in our foreign policy due to the sever several reasons. Today, there is a consensus between, it between elites, between our population about our future, common future with the European Union. But it's uh, not the best times maybe to now to, 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 to come to Europe and say why we are, you want to be a part of Europe because uh, despite the internal problem, our success or mm, uh, in success in our reforms, there is a lot of problem inside of European Union. We are happy with little which we receive from European Union little encouraging, little uh, discussing, little m uh, much little money. But in any way, this is for us no questions and no doubts about, you know, value. We share value with the European Union. For us, my, from my perspective, uh, from my point of view, it's much more important to implement European model of development than to be in European Union which is maybe the dream for us because to sell to internally for public opinion in Europe, next enlargement will be very difficult due to the, the several reasons I don't want to, to mention once again this, uh, this, uh, this problem. Uh, and one more. The most important statement in our summit, uh, summit until now it's what's the statement of our Georgian colleagues, uh, which is practically end of any speculation about future of uh, intention of uh, Georgia. In some sense, for us, Georgia it was a benchmark in implementation of reforms, democracy, and, and so on. F I've been in Georgia several times. For me, it was not so sh you know, sure about what's happening in Georgia during the last 10 years. I think this is was partially true through project uh, b b uh, um, democratical and economical uh, procedure pr process and at the same time it was a it was a PR project now it's time for Georgian to give some muscles for all this PR project and I congratulate the new government to this nice statement which is close any speculation about position of uh, Georgia in the, in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Just very briefly, Ria, and then I'm gonna turn to the audience and come back to you, Mr. Only, only one sentence. I want to take away every misunderstanding that I wouldn't love to have good neighborly relations from your countries with Russia. I am the one who is 
uh, uh, co-responsible uh, 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 for the new, for the new uh, 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 partnership agreement, European Union to Russia. So I, I, I did please in, in, in Poland, for instance, no doubt. But to share two different views is not uh, 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 quite simple. Because do you speak with the Russians also about your uh, uh, foreign and security uh, uh, politics? There you will have you, you will have a problem, I think. So, uh, Minister Petrashvili, the other issue that uh, Ria put on the table was the concern, extending your Atlanticism as much about what happens internally as your external policy. So when your prime minister was in Brussels, uh, he heard from senior EU and NATO officials concern about uh, allegations of potential retribution against members of the former government, the, uh, the charges that are out there against the defense minister, other senior military officers. Would you be willing to address that to help uh, address those concerns about sure. maintaining the civil liberties uh, uh, that Georgian <coughs> citizens and former government officials should enjoy? Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, reminding me the questions because <laughs> the last thing, uh, you know, all uh, last year since the Georgia's independence, we are always been hearing that Georgia is the subject to confrontation between the United States and Russia, between EU and Russia. So last thing I want today is that it has to become the subject to confrontation between Turkey and the EU. And so <laughs> I hope it's, uh, it will be just very uh, healthy debate. But um, I can tell you very honestly that, uh, first of all, uh, on uh, the uh, developments, recent developments in Georgia, uh, Prime Minister Ivanishvili at his very successful meetings in Brussels has uh, raised this issue uh, himself and offered to the international community, first of all, reassured that all investigation uh, will uh, go under the very serious monitoring of the international community and with all due respect to the uh, international standards of the human rights, with the, uh, with the law, rule of law, and the justice and the court will be free and independent in making decisions from the political pressure. I can assure the audience, can assure you, that there will be no more selective justice in Georgia. That is uh, very important for us because if I go back to the uh, uh, court decision uh, <laughs> figures, it will make very different that uh, 992 uh, percent of the court decisions were in favor of uh, prosecution, but it, but it was in past. I can tell you that uh, the uh, democratic reforms, the judiciary system reforms, and the, all the investigations and all the particular cases, and don't think that that is not concerning us personally, because uh, it is always a concern when the uh, acting uh, chairman of the uh, defense forces is under the investigation, in particular with the relationship with NATO. But the questions which are existing and the evidences which are coming up during the investigation must be uh, responded. Uh, and uh, we believe that the, uh, the cabinet members, the Minister for Justice, new Minister for Justice, uh, who is very uh, highly professional and open to the international community, as well as the Prosecutor General, and having very uh, uh, often uh, communication with the diplomatic corps represented in Georgia, will, uh, uh, will close any questions with regard to the uh, political uh, repressions and the, with regard to the selective justice. In upcoming few days, in upcoming future, there may be in other cases, but I can tell you that uh, it will be under the very, very uh, serious monitoring of the international community. And uh, the second issue is with regard to the uh, two-track. Uh, we have uh, uh, started to uh, try to have a dialogue with Russia. And first of all, when we are underlining the issue of the economic ties, of trade, Russia has become, with our consent, 
the member of WTO. There is a bilateral, uh, on both sides, there is a will of uh, reopening the uh, trade relationship between the, between the two neighbors. And we are uh, vitally interested in getting back Georgian product to the Russian markets. And uh, I believe every uh, country uh, is interested in getting their goods to the Russian markets, to the huge market. I doubt very much that this will be the issue for the trade-off uh, for Russians because they also, in my belief, they also want to make a, make a step forward. I am not uh, in illusions that they will make an, uh, a reverse of their recognition in upcoming years, but we have to start, we have to start with trade with uh, cultural ties, with the humanitarian project, with the public diplomacy, with Abkhaz, with Ossetian brothers, and to demonstrate the Georgia, that Georgia is the kind of country where they would be happy to return as a democratic and a very economically developing country. This is the key to the uh, relationship with Abkhaz and the Ossetians. And, uh, but I must uh, reiterate here, that uh, the process of integration with uh, EU and NATO will go much faster and much more dynamically than uh, uh, with uh, the Russian Federation, there is no doubt. I was always saying we will start the negotiations, but they will be very difficult. There is no illusion that it will be easy negotiations. But I must remind my uh, distinguished friends and colleagues here in the, uh, this room the uh, negotiations on the uh, withdrawal of the Russian military bases, they were very tough. I have participated in those negotiations and there were the same four-star generals who were fighting thumbs and nails of not getting withdrawn uh, their military forces. Okay, there was different times, but it happened. It happened and ended here in Istanbul in 1999 with a historic uh, agreement on the withdrawal. So that is uh, nothing can, that cannot happen, but we need to move and we have the potential of starting talking with Russian Federation and continue integrating in the EU and NATO. Mr. Minister, thank you. I think two, you. two important statements, one to hear um, of no more, I, no selective justice in Georgia, I think it's an important statement to make. Um, one of the countries we haven't talked about is Ukraine in this discussion. And obviously, as, as the trials have played out in Ukraine, it's disrupted Ukraine's relationship with Europe. And I think having that at the square of the government's new agenda is going, going to be quite important to continue to advance your relationship with Europe, as well as the idea of trying to rebuild something with Russia on the basis of trade as it enters the World Trade Organization real opportunity there. I'm sensitive to Just very small Very remarks, brief because I want to bring brief, in the audience. Uh, when I was saying there are no more selective justice, I was meaning uh, the selective justice which we were witnessing before October 1st, mm -hmm. not after that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, let me bring in the, uh, the gentleman here, please. Uh, please, question in the front. I think we'll, we can hear you. Right. And if you could speak up just a bit so we can hear you here. Sorry, here's the, here's the mic. I apologize for that. Thank you. Uh, from the inside of the EU, how we see things. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for your initial uh, intervention, which uh, uh, I liked. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you spoke about values. And there I, th we, I think that the European Union has serious problems. Uh, values because uh, there is a democratic deficit in the European Union. We are no longer democratic as we used to be. I would say one thing. The measures that were adopted by Greek Parliament last week were unconstitutional. They were against the Greek constitution. And uh, it was voted upon and the European Union applauded it. They welcomed it. 
So um, that's one aspect. And then there's the other aspect, that the European Union is destroying one of its member states now. The society is uh, dissolving. Unemployment has increased with the measures taken by the European Union to 25, 26%. And uh, this was a result of the measures uh, in order to resolve uh, the problem. So as uh, Minister Abayis said, that you don't want to join an EU that will be bankrupt, perhaps we might reach that, uh, that level. Thank, Thank you. you. And let me, if, if others have questions or comments, it. please catch my, you catch can my attention. Us. So we've managed to get uh, the Greeks and the Turks offering a critique of Brussels. So uh, Ria is a representative of the parliament. Uh, the, point, the point is, uh, um, the measures which have to be taken now by uh, uh, Greece, Spain, uh, Ireland, uh, Portugal, are harsh. That are recognized. And they have very, uh, very much social consequences. I recognize that. But it's not Europe who caused your problem. You did it yourself. If you have an, a budget uh, uh, deficit, which is over 200%, it's you who caused the problem, and you gave the wrong information. I would like you to join me when I am defending the measures not only the austerity marriage from your country, but also I'm, when I'm defending the money which the European Union has to spend in Greece and all the other countries and all the other countries to uh, resolve the crisis, then you would be aware that citizens in my country don't accept that. But I defend it, and I will defend it but that you also have to do something in Greece and perhaps also look over what amounts of money is already gone from your country by big traders, uh, uh, big companies, uh, 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 wealthy persons abroad. Do you bring it back? And Ria, the, the, as, as the EU struggles with this issue of the financial crisis, as it struggles with the position no, of a current member the state. Financial it's crisis, yet the financial crisis is, co is caused by member states and banks. But, but my question is the lack, there's a strain on the sense of solidarity within Europe. And at a time of strain within the sense of solidarity inside the EU, what, are the, what does that mean in terms of forging a new sense of solidarity, new bonds? with the countries on this platform that are representative today? No, no, no. there is solidarity. There is almost, in all the fundings for uh, uh, those countries, there is a reserve of almost uh, 1,000 billion uh, euros to solve the problems. That is the fact, going to the ESM and all the other funds. Mm -hmm. That's the fact. Mm -hmm. That money is available. And because of that fact, we can restore the confidence also in Greece. But that also Greece, like Turkey also had to do 10 years ago. You also had a crisis, a financial crisis. And then your, your citizens suffer. It's caused by politicians. But <coughs> citizens suffer now. But we have to give them an, an, a good an, an, an light in, 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 in the future. There, I totally agree. Thank you, Ria. We have a, just a few more minutes, so I want to try to catch any remaining questions from the audience. If we could bring the mic back to this gentleman, and if there's an, an, another person, just catch uh, my I'm Pierre Morel, I'm former special representative of the European Union for the last six years. Uh, and I've uh, had a strange experience here in Istanbul or Ankara. The more I visit Ankara or Istanbul, the more I hear Europe bashing of Europe. Bashing of Europe is, uh, is quite usual. And the more I come, and the more I've been working very efficiently on Central Asia. So we have a rather two-tire system. And I, I think many Europeans can, could say a lot about working with Turkey anyway. Uh, there is too much emotion. There's too much playing with public opinion. And this is dangerous. And we should uh, scale down 
because everybody is under pressure and everybody is under tension. You can say, we are successful, you are stupid, you are bad. I mean, I don't think you would convince 500 uh, million citizens that way and 27 fully equal and independent countries whose position in the end will be determining uh, for future uh, expansion of the union, which is necessary. But I don't think we will win in playing on emotions. I would just add something on this uh, uh, Europe of failure and so on. Tremendous steps, undreamed of, have been done in the last two years of this uh, uh, failing Europe. Sorry, I mean, nobody would have been ready for that. And I would like just to take two s small examples. Moldova, Transnistria, I've been ambassador to, uh, uh, this has been a drama. This has been a terrible situation. Step by step, it's too slow, but Europe is trying to contribute with others to solving this pending drama for a nation which is cut off its own path. So we know that and we care for that. And believe me, to convince somebody in Lisbon or, or in Dublin or in Paris or elsewhere that they have to care about the problem in Tiraspol, you have to work with 500 citizens, 500 million citizens. This is part of the game. And this is what the European Parliament is doing in watching. Second example, Georgia. I've been there working endlessly for three years. We stopped the war. Sorry, we don't solve the problem. It's a big problem, which has 20 years of history of war, but we did it. And I would have said to our European countries four years ago, you will pick four, 300 uh, uh, people to go there and be on this uh, no man's land and work for years. They would not have gone, but they stay now and they continue the job. And I think everybody recognizes it. So this is also Europe. It's just work done and not polemics and feelings put too high in this present situation. Mm -hmm. Sorry, thank you. No, thank you very much. And uh, for all of us, that, I will, for all of us that, that know your work, you've done a tremendous work job in helping to connect Europe to Central Asia as well. And we haven't gotten that into the conversation. We have just under five minutes left. So what I wanna do is come back to all of you to uh, offer, be able to respond to what you've just heard, but use that to offer some concluding comments uh, for our audience here as well as the television audience. And uh, Minister Bosch, why don't we start with you? But uh, I'm going to, if you could, as you think about responding to what you've heard, part of this is how do we think about avoiding the, a negative dynamic that pushes Turkey and the European Union further away from each other as you go through the negotiating process? And how, as you watch the evolution of Turkish public opinion, how do you actually create a more positive spiral, positive dynamic? You're about to begin constitutional reforms. If you could work that into your your conclusion as well as how that relates to the agenda. And then we'll work down the line for a conclusion. Thank you. Churchill once said something about Americans, which is actually very accurate about Europeans today. He said Americans always do the right thing after exploiting all the other options. We are now witnessing Europe who are trying to exploit all, all the other options, and I'm sure at the end they will do the right thing. We're not playing with emotions in Turkey. We have realities which create frustration. The reality is Turkey is the only candidate or potential candidate country whose citizens are still forced to apply for visas to go to the Schengen region. That's discriminatory. The Cyprus problem, which was not a prerequisite for membership of Cyprus, is now being portrayed as if it's a prerequisite for Turkey. Europe has an economic crisis. Turkey is a market of 75 million with the fastest growing economy and a bridge to 1.5 billion consumers within three hours of flying. But, and as a member of customs union, we are having a lot of difficulties in terms of trade relations as well, which we deal with the Commission. Europe has another upcoming crisis, which my Georgian colleague mentioned, vis-a-vis -vis energy. 75% of all energy resources Europe needs today are either to the south, north, or east of Turkey. So unless someone comes up with a new wireless technology of energy distribution, Turkey's cooperation is a must for Europe. But the chapter on energy is blocked only because Cyprus feels like blocking it. You talked about the interest of 500 million Europeans. Don't let 
500,000 take away the interest of 500 million hostage. We have to come to our senses in terms of those relations. Turkey is suffering from PKK terrorism, and PKK is a terrorist organization which is on the list of EU's terrorist organization, can build tents in city centers of some of the capitals of Europe and collect donations. That's something wrong there. We have to be honest with each other. We have to be credible partners. And my nation, which had 78% support for EU membership back in 2005, has now around 30%, 35% support. I am doing my best to re-engineer the public support, but my people see the facts. And the response to your question, what we can do, the first immediate thing that needs to be done is to lift visas against Turkish citizens. If it takes the readmission agreement, we are willing to do it. We already spent four years on and finalized the text of the readmission agreement. We even initialed it to show that we are serious about it. But we need to be given a clear promise with a date when the visas will be lifted. Then we are willing to spend our funds, our resources, our personnel in terms of processing with the contents of the readmission agreement. But unfortunately, as I said, we have seen 53 years of unkept promises by Europe. So we're not going to take a pat on the shoulder to do what needs to be done. We need a clear commitment. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Let me turn to you, Minister Petriashvili, for your final word. I'm going to remind, <laughs> if you. I could ask each of you to be very brief. We're uh, bumping up against the lunch. So, First uh, of all, in praising Ms. Ambassador Morel in doing wonderful job in last, uh, during last years for negotiating uh, uh, the conflict with Russia, Georgia's conflict with Russia in the frame of the uh, Geneva talks. And I'm, uh, I must underline as well and, and uh, express my appreciation for the EU monitoring mission doing a very important job and, uh, uh, and which is facing the problems from the other side of the conflict. Uh, but uh, I must say that um, there is, um, with regard to the reforms in the frame of the European Union, there is a very wonderful initiative which is called More for More. I mean, <laughs> so we are always uh, uh, demanding more for more. So we are progressing, we are developing, we are moving forward, and we are uh, doing our best to speed up the process of the integration uh, in EU and NATO, so we will be looking forward for getting the reciprocal uh, response on, uh, from the EU side, and we really value the uh, support which we are receiving from the European Union, uh, <coughs> technically, financially, politically. And uh, finally, last but not least, we uh, have been discussing the issue of the occupation issue of the occupation is of the, uh, our vital importance and uh, we will be continuing the negotiations and the consultations because the policy of the uh, uh, occupation recognition will be very important in terms of keeping the uh, issue very important for the international community. Thank, Thank you. you, Minister Petras. Let me come to you, Ria. Yeah, yeah, I, I would like to come back to the positive agenda, which was mentioned by um, Mr. Baish before. He said, we do good things. The problem is, as the ambassador said, that we have to defend an enlargement on 75 Turkish citizens in the European Union in a time where Europe is indeed, for the financial crisis, already suffering. Because the Dutch, the Belgians, the Luxembourgs, the Irish, and also the new countries have to pay for the debts 
of the others. And in that crisis, we see that such a large potential comes to us. And we, we, we need then to see how can we pick them up. We are all, the ambassador and I and, and my colleagues, are defending the enlargement of Turkey. But in the moment that Turkey itself is bashing us, then our citizens ask us, what are we doing? Why should we do it? And I have the impression, but I can't transmit that to everybody, I have the impression that sometimes discussions are, 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 are only for internal use. If we are speaking about uh, 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 the death penalty, it was this government who ratified, who ratified to the, 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 con the conventions. So I don't think so that you, Do you want to limit freedom of speech so in I Turkey? Think, no, I, think, I don't I think mean, that... It's a it, discussion. No, it, yes, but I don't think that it was serious. But that, makes, that gives a negative here. influence in the European society. And that is what I would like to avoid. Also on the PKK, we were absolutely strong in the European Parliament on it. And you know that. Final, you know that. Final word, you know? Okay. My final yeah. word is, let's start a dialogue. Let's have a bit of confidence in each other. And don't use all the, uh, 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 the bashing issues as, as, <coughs> as, as, as uh, debates for intel, uh, use them for, inter, for <coughs> internally, but don't do it anymore so that we come, can come closer together. That's what I would like to see. All right, I'm going to turn to Mr. Prime Minister Storz uh, for the final word of yes, the panel. Yes, I want to be positive in any way. Please, a brief final comment. Yeah, despite of problem in the European Union, we believe in this project. And uh, for us, uh, Europe, first of all, it's a place of high level of standards and peace. But Europeans don't play with these values. Thank you. All right, what a, 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 a good way to end. I think what we've seen, what we're talking about is joining the family. We're talking about extending your Atlanticism. And join the family, there are always heated debates, and I think we've seen that today. Um, but is, what is remarkable that even as Europe is going through its own financial crisis, its political crisis, you have a Turkey that is advancing reforms. You have a Georgia and Moldova that are concluding deep and comprehensive free trade agreements. Despite the problems that are uh, taking place across the continent, this process of extending your Atlanticism, um, it moves forward. And there's a degree of inevitability taking place right now, and I think we're grateful for that. That's something that the Atlantic Council intends to stand behind and continue working with all of you in the, the weeks and months ahead. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking the panel.